Hello, I'm Natalie Bartz from BMI, and this is Charm Polling from White Bear PR. Hi, well everybody. <laughs> Welcome to our presentation, Behind the Score of Lovecraft Country. Please allow us to introduce you today to composer Laura Cartman. Laura Cartman is a five-time Emmy Award-winning composer who has collaborated with filmmakers such as Misha Green, Steven Spielberg, Rory Kennedy, and the Ford Coppola family. She is known for her Grammy Award-winning album, Ask You Mama, a multimedia opera based on poems by Langston Hughes. Her recent work on the HBO hit series, Lovecraft Country, earned her critical acclaim. And coming up next, she will score the Marvel Studios series, What If, coming to Disney Plus on August 6th. She currently serves as governor of the music branch of the Motion Picture Academy. Welcome, Laura. Laura, <laughs> so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for doing this. We are so excited for your deep dive into Lovecraft Country. The show is so fantastic. So I know people are gonna love this. Oh, great. Well, I'm so glad to be here. It, I'm sorry that we're not all together. Although I have to say, even though I love Comic-Con, there is something, let's say a little more sedate about doing it this, this way, but <laughs> we'll wake you all up out of whatever, whatever you're doing. So, you know, when Chandler and Natalie asked me to look at Lovecraft, I, there's something that I haven't done yet. And so I wanted to share that with you guys. And that is basically episode 10. And in episode 10 are all the e Easter eggs of the whole show. And so you're going to hear things here first that I've not really spoken publicly about, nor have I dived into it. So I'm really excited just, just to share this with you guys for the first time and talk about um, episode 10. Now, episode 10 was the last episode we scored, even though everything was really out of order in the show. Um, looking back, I'm very glad for that. And I'll explain why a little bit as we go on. But I really wanted to bring back every major character theme from the entire show in episode 10 and rethink those themes, re-explore them and recontextualize them to what, what building up to a big finish for at least the season, hopefully not for the whole show, but who knows. So, um, so the first theme that I wanted to talk about was the Artem theme. Um, now, this is something that Raphael and, and I have spoken a lot about publicly. Um, basically, when Misha spoke about what she was looking for musically in the show, she talked about gothic R&B. And I would say that this cue, really, this theme, really embraces and embodies that concept. And it was really one of those true equal work of, of me and Raphael and that, you know, he did a lot of the sound design for the show. I did the orchestral writing, but in this particular cue, we really came together and uh, here's a little ditty on the piano. It goes, oh. which is, it's all these for all you musicians. It's all, it's literally continuously chromatic. And for me, that sounded like, like almost like an iconic, like um, Twilight Zone theme. But he sent it first to me because this is the pandemic. We were not together in the room um, as his guitar and bass and a, a few synths in the background. So let's, let's listen to this theme as it first appears at the end of the first episode.
I really like that. I thought that it made me feel like a little uneasy, but also anticipating what's going to happen. I, I, I think that's a fantastic cue. It's hip too. That's the thing I like about it is you really get like Rothe, like what he does best, which is this incredible hipness. And I think one of the things that I learned from working with him is that he thinks about time and the beat really differently than I do. And everything sits behind the beat, right? Every, it just, it like feels, it's, it's, it's very not classical, right? So that combined with this kind of Gothic and this almost over class, class, classical music, you know, almost on purpose because they're coming up to this ridiculous mansion where really scary bad things happen, but this kind of over the top thing. So this real combination of our heroes at that moment who, um, who are very beautiful and hip coming into this like overblown, you know, mansion is, is great. I also love, and I've always loved Raphael's drum playing because he's not a drummer, but there's something really cool about the way that he plays. Um, so anyway, there's that. Now listen to it in episode 10. So now we've been through the whole series, Tick, our hero, Letty, our heroine, they've been through hell and back. And now we are really coming um, on to Tick um getting ready to sacrifice himself for his people It's a really good place to stop. There's another um, incredible Easter egg in that one, and that is Es muss sein, muss es sein. And does anybody, do, neither of you know what that reference is, right? That's very us. No, <laughs> I don't know it. <laughs> in late, in the, the last string quartet of Beethoven, he writes, muss es sein, es muss sein, which means must it be, if must be. And a lot of people feel that it's referring to his own death. So that became lyrics for the choir because Tick knows that he's sacrificing himself, that he's going to die. So that's another sort of, you know, <laughs> good little surprise in there. Okay. So, so, you know, it's all, it was really um, remarkable for me to have this opportunity to play like this and to really have that this kind of creative freedom to write the lyrics to come up with ideas to use themes and to do that whole thing all right so um the next thing that i want to talk about is another cue called magic is ours now um so basically tick kills himself or or uh, he doesn't kill himself he allows himself to be killed um maybe that's the same thing i don't know so that his people can have all the magic so it doesn't belong just to the white people and of course these metaphors go on and on and on so take a listen to this theme first and then let me talk to you a little bit actually you know what let, i'm going to take that back um i am going to play the um play some of the stuff on the piano so you get a sense of it and then you can listen to it so episode nine and Chandler, you and i've talked about this a little bit um, is, uh, was written um, in long, not long, but two months before I worked on uh, episode 10, even though it, they're subsequent. And so in the piece of opera that I wrote, the end of it goes, um, right? 
right? Brother, brother, sister, sister, come, come. You know, sister, sister, brother, brother, come, come. So this little theme. Sister, brother, brother, come, come, became the ancestor theme. Ancestors and the protection of that ancestors provide to the generations that are alive is something that's very much a part of, I think, the dialogue in the Black community and very much a part of the dialogue in this show. So I wrote, I wrote that, and then that became, in the two or three subsequent episodes, became the ancestors theme. So you have that. And then you also have something from the very, very first um, episode, the end of the, uh, no, I'm sorry, not the end, the beginning of the first episode, when Tick is having a dream, there's this hero theme. And that is again, that kind of almost over the top, bomb, ba -da, you know, like almost Marvel. French horn hero theme, okay? So listen to this, and you'll hear first in the harp the. And then you'll hear the hero theme because Tick has made the ultimate sacrifice, which is becoming a hero to generations and generations of people as it's portrayed in the story. Know the what I don't know. I don't know what yes. Peter said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I definitely know. heard it. I got I got goosebumps listening to that track. It was it was really beautiful. Thank you. But you know, once again, it's this like it's really these conflation of of multiple themes, and um, I think that that's why when you do a series like this, or you know, really any film, but I think almost more urgently in a series that if you build up these themes over episode and episode, even if you don't get it, like even if you don't hear the whole thing or get anything that somehow in your body, you feel it and, and you're, you know, you're familiar with, um, with what, what the materials are. And as you hear, there are other things and there are new things that come to bear. And, you know, that, 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 that becomes basically, it's a, they're carrying his casket and they're, the whole family is marching. So, so that becomes um, that becomes um, really real. It's 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 a it's a dirge, you know, another requiem. So, but it pulls from other materials that I think become really important, essential to the show, to the series. Okay, so finally, I mean, we could go on like this forever, and I love talking about it. Um, 
we have the very, very here, I'm, I'm loaded in paper here. So I'm gonna throw, put some of this stuff away. Um, we have two of my absolute favorite themes from the show. Um, again, another really important theme from the first episode. And you guys, maybe, maybe um, Chandler and Natalie will show this to you, but this is actually a picture of my left hand scrawled music um, when I wrote it with arrows and all of that stuff. Um, this is one of the first things that I wrote. So let me see if I can read it. This is the family theme. try it again. So very simple, right? It's almost like a lullaby right? And so you hear that in the very first episode when Tick comes home, and that's something that, that, that occurs over and over again. Okay, another, this theme isn't quite as recognizable, but it's, it's, one of, it's one of my favorite moments in the whole show. Okay, so in episode four, Hippolyta and uh, Diana go to the Natural History Museum or the, yes, I believe the Natural History Museum in Boston and, and they discover, you know, kind of, it's the Raiders of the Lost Ark episode. But there's a moment um, that's really, really beautiful. And then this theme, this moment, it, the name of the cue is Mama Named a Comet. And this, this moment becomes one of, one of my favorite, favorite moments and then becomes their theme, Hippolyta and Diana, who are mother and daughter. Um, there's something also re really unique about this moment for me as a composer. Um, because of the way that we recorded the show, right? The whole show is recorded by individual musicians. We have the same first violins playing as we did second violins. And that's done for very practical reasons. So you want fewer people sending you pieces of audio and we had them all placed and the mics placed for each violinist. Um, but because of that, the second violins don't function the way that they normally do, at least for me as a composer in a secondary role or in unison with the first violins, because if the second violins play in unison with the first violins, you're gonna have um, all kinds of aliasing and, and phasing. Does everybody understand that? Do you guys understand that? Okay. So what happened for me is that I wound up doing these interwoven lines between the first and the second violin. So the second violin was no longer playing second fiddle, excuse the pun. They were really emerging as an important force. And so it was more just, just like you'd have the first violin doing and then the second violin and then they'd switch places. So registrally the first violin would come down and the second violin would come up. Let me see if I can show you that a little bit here on the piano. So that's very traditional, right? The second violins in a secondary part. Ah. Do you hear how they just cross so that you have the first violin doing this, the second violin repeating it, right? second violin is. I can't even do it. Right? Sorry, wrong note. So you see, did you see my hands are completely crossing so that the second violin winds up rising above it? I think it's like, it's gorgeous. And it, it, it gives a lift to the music that, that you wouldn't have. And I think actually we don't have that audio prepared for you here, but I think we'll give you a little sample of that so you can hear it, okay? But we have that. So the very, very, very last cue, Diana has killed Christina, who's a bad, bad white lady. She is gone, she is dead. And Diana, this young girl, young woman, I would have to say at this point, is, is the next generation. And so her hero theme becomes the family theme. But this, 
starts the beginning of the queue. So let's take a listen to full circle. And I also want to say before we do that, at the end, you will hear more choir. The what you will hear is I can't even say it, but we have we have some visuals for you here. Mogara, 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 Ra, Sibu, Lumi. That is all the book of names. So literally, they've been seeking the book of names the entire 10 episodes. And so what you hear very, very last in the music is the choir reciting the book of names. So let's hear the last cue of the series, uh, which is a uh, full circle. Oh. Well, I never would wow. have thought that with the strings, like, you know, it sounds special, but like just hearing you, how you explained how you wrote that, it makes so much sense now. Well, what it does is it lifts in a way. And for me, and again, this is like, you know, um, maybe it's too much insider trading, but it's, I, I, I think 
I've listened to like a lot of English string music like Benjamin Britten and uh, Rayfon Williams. And I now understand it better. And because so much of it is that like those shifting of parts and I never really got that. And it's so odd that the pandemic and recording in this way um, would teach me something about orchestration that I never expected to learn. And I think, I mean, for me, it's so funny we're talking about this because um, we're getting this new little dog today, Fauci, and we, we're calling Fauci and uh, she's little now. I think she won't be for very long, but um, I've been thinking about all the gifts of the pandemic and as terrible as it is, and so many lives were lost and so much horrible stuff. And just personally, you know, having to work like this and to live in such fear and, uh, you know, and I was living in a lot of fear for a lot of the time. But there were so many things that happened that were so unexpected, you know, and, and I think with Lovecraft, you know, Misha is somebody who's very much involved in the music and we got lots of notes. I'm not saying that we didn't because there were things that she didn't like and multiple rewrites on things. And, but there was a sense of freedom you know, she also lets people do their work. But I also think the fact that we were kind of on our own, um, it, it yielded in certain cases, I think, more creativity, you know, oddly. Um, and because we were all able to have a lot of quiet time and quiet space, you know, even with the Zooms and stuff like that, when the Zooms turn off, you're there by yourself with your family and it's quiet. Um, and so I do think that a lot of, um, I wrote, I had, a, I wrote a lot of really good music this year. Um, and I think a lot of it was because I did have a kind of a quiet that I didn't expect, even though there was so much anxiety and, you know, we moved to Canada for a time. And I mean, we were really, it was really wacky, but, um, and what are some tools you think, Laura, that you'll take away from this COVID experience that you want to kind of sort of continue with as we get I out think I mean, I definitely think taking the time you need for certain things is really important. I mean, I did that before, but I think that that, you know, that that has been really apparent to me. Um, I started a hobby. I started fencing. I've never had a hobby in my life. OK, ever. And it just so happened in Vancouver, there was a great fencing studio and some friends of ours, their kid was doing it. And so I thought, oh, this will be fun for Benny, uh, my son. And I did it when I was a kid. And then I watched him do it. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to do this. Now I'm completely obsessed, right? I, we have a great fencing um, uh, club right near us. I'm there like four times a week. And my coach is, uh, was number eight in the US. She's incredible. And so being able to actually interact with somebody outside of my field who is so excellent at what she does, like I make her fence me hard because I just spend the whole time laughing because it's so insane. Like I can't get a hit, right? And so for somebody who's, you know, I'm used to like, I mean, I'm, I'm used to mastery of my craft. Thank God I've gotten to the point where I'm a master of my craft to do something that's totally new that I completely suck at is really, really good for me. So I think, I think this combination of newness and being with the family and being in, you know, uh, you know, also we took ourselves out, we took ourselves to a new environment to try to have it be a year of expansion rather than a year of contraction. Um, I think that's also really good for your mind. Um, and I, I did it you know, ostensibly for Benny, because I didn't want him at such a pivotal, a pivotal developmental moment in his life to shut down. But I think it wound up opening me up too, in a way that um, continues to surprise me. And when I listen back to this music, it's funny just sitting here with you guys listening to it. I hear it. You know, I hear it. We hear it and we feel it too. 
Right, Chandler? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And, and with that, we just really want to thank you for taking the time to kind of walk us through all these amazing themes and how they evolved in Lovecraft Country over the 10 episodes. It was really great to hear your explanations of it because you can enjoy music, of course, just as a passive listener. But once you hear the intricacies, especially in the recording process and and also the in the intention of what you're trying to do with the cues and the, and the themes is really eye opening. So I'm really glad that you took the time to do this. Thank you so much. Oh, and listen, thanks for the opportunity because I've been meaning to do this about episode 10 and I just haven't had the, the form to do it. So I really appreciate it. And all, all you people who are mourning not being at Comic-Con, I so appreciate you coming here and spending this time with me and, and my work. It, it means a lot to me. Yeah, thank you everybody for tuning in from Comic-Con at home. And we look forward to seeing you all in person, hopefully in the near future. Great, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, <everyone. laughs>